Hi everybody, I'm Rick Hansen and this is the Foundations of Wellbeing uh, with the Pillar of Mindfulness. And I'm extremely happy and actually even a little nervous to be here with the legendary Jack Cornfield, friend of mine and certainly a major teacher of mine, uh, head of Spirit Rock Meditation Center in California, USA, and also someone who is one of the leading figures in bringing mindfulness and self-awareness as well as uh, other aspects of contemplative practice to the West. So Jack, in terms of people uh, being able to sustain this present moment awareness of mindfulness, uh, one of the issues I've seen with people, I bet you've seen it yourself, is that for some people, uh, the notion of opening to their own experience or opening up to seeing what's actually happening inside um, is scary. Uh, they're afraid that it would be like opening a trap door to hell. Uh, both certainly people who've been traumatized, but really people in general. And so I'm wondering what you've seen that helps people uh, have the courage to become increasingly mindful, perhaps telling about yourself, because when you began your own mindfulness training, uh, you had a fair amount of pain too. And how did you uh, develop the willingness and the capacity to be with what's there without being overwhelmed by it? Well, for myself, one of the things that helped a great deal was the humor and um, wisdom of my teacher uh, who said, you know, you're going to sit and you'll be lonely. You're far away from home. He said, you might even feel like you're dying of loneliness. And here's a practice. He said, begin to name this. So you'll sit there and you'll be meditating and then you'll feel how lonely you are and you name it lonely lonely and you think I can't bear this and he said so name it I can't bear it and then you think I'm gonna die of loneliness and I won't see my poor mother and he would imitate me and I'd start laughing and he'd say so he said so then name it dying dying you know and my poor mother poor mother poor mother and he said and then you do that for a little while and then all of a sudden you'll recognize that you're hungry and you wonder you know well, what are you going to get for your next meal? He said, because the mind has no pride, you know, and it will die in one moment and they'll say, all right, now I'm going to go shopping in the next one. <laughs> and he described the way we are as human beings with so much um, graciousness and so little judgment that that alone kind of laid out the territory so that when I sat and I felt the ordinary things that we all do, <clears throat> which was loneliness or the conflict that I'd been in, the fears that I had for somebody that I cared about, um, the needs that I didn't want to feel at times, my own neediness, for example, which I didn't like. Um, I could have a little bit of humor about it and see that it's actually just human. We all have needs. We all have loneliness. We all have a certain measure of um, feeling isolated or, or longing that's unmet. And it's not that there's something wrong with us. This is just one part of us. But he knew, and he would say, you know, you, um, not only can you become mindful of this, but this isn't who you really are. Who you are is, the, is this mysterious consciousness of awareness that can know this. And who you are is so much wiser than this. You have the heart of a Buddha he would say, and you can take your seat as the Buddha did and witness these different experiences from a space of loving awareness and you become wise, you become kind. Mm -hmm. Now the other thing I need to add is that along with our ordinary human suffering that some people who've never been alone with themselves get worried about it, it turns out it's totally wonderful and you learn the capacity to do it pretty quickly and you realize, I can do this. Um, mm -hmm. We also carry, um, in many of our lives, as I did, um, significant trauma. And I had the trauma from my own early family life that was pretty painful. Um, and for that, um, as you sit or learn to be mindful or meditate in different ways, um, it's really important that you don't just directly go to the trauma. Um, that trauma can be healed, which is a totally um, radical thing for us to understand and know. We don't have to live at the effect of trauma for our whole life. Um, but it becomes healed in stages. The first stage, which you know well because it's central to what you have been teaching, um, is to f establish a sense of well-being in yourself. 
And it can be the well-being of a posture where you find yourself able to sit well um, and, you know, your feet on the floor, your buttocks on the on the chair, um, or it may be the well-being where you remember somebody that you really love, your, you know, or someone who loved you, your grandmother or your uncle, and they held you. Um, you realize, I, I really belong here. I feel good. Or you remember some place or time in your life when you felt very safe. And from that place of well-being and stability, or maybe just the well-being of mindfulness of your breathing, when either trauma arises or you are drawn to try to heal it, then you can go a little bit at a time and say, well, let me remember a little bit of this or let me feel it when it's come up um, with loving awareness and acknowledge it and feel how it is in the body, the pain or the contraction, and then say, all right, I've done this for a minute or two, a little bit enough. Now let me go back to well-being. And so you kind of go back and forth using the strength of well-being so you don't get overwhelmed by the trauma. And little by little, you kind of feel the body, you feel the emotions, oh, the pain, all the things that were un, you were unable to bear. And little by little, you learn that you can bear them, and they untangle. They start to release themselves. This is true for physical pain as well. Some people come into meditation, and they have chronic pain, or they have a lot of physical pain they deal with. And it's what John Kabat-Zinn began um, working with in the hospital setting where he first started teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction. He said, send me the patients that you can't help to the doctors in the rounds at the hospital um, and because we have a clinic that may be able to serve them. And then he said to me, privately he said, because we have the great medicine, <laughs> which is the medicine of being able to be present for your own life, the medicine of mindfulness, that after you've done all the medical things that you can and you still have pain or you still have suffering, we have the medicine that teaches you how to be with life. Um, and uh, again, with chronic pain or with great physical pain, we contract. Um, we're afraid. We tell stories. This will never get better. My life will will be awful from now on. So we have the emotions of fear and can, we have the physical contraction. We have all these stories. And with mindfulness, you first start to notice the stories and let them relax a little. You become curious. You notice the emotions, the fear, the pain of it. And then again, in a very loving way, you start to approach the pain, not to make it your main focus, but for a little while, you hold that pain as if you were holding a crying infant. You know, you've changed their diaper, they've been fed, but they're still crying and there's nothing that you can do physically for them. But just the fact that you hold that child in your hands with love and attention, after a while they, ha uh, uh, they begin to uh, uh, settle down and realize that they're being held. And in the same way with mindfulness and loving awareness, you can actually bring that care to the places of pain in the body and all that's held around them begins to soften. It doesn't mean that you have to stay with the pain because staying with pain for a long time, if it's strong, can weary the nervous system, weary the mind. But you learn how to not be afraid of it. And then after you're not so afraid, so there isn't all those thoughts and feelings that had a lot of suffering, okay, this is the pain, I can be with it some, then you can direct your attention to well-being elsewhere. So all of this tells you that there's an art that you as a person learning mindfulness can use to be with the fear or loneliness or physical pain or conflict that you carry, tending it with loving awareness, relaxing around it and realizing I can feel this, I can be with my body or with these emotions, I can see these thoughts without being so reactive to them and then they start to settle down and you begin to trust the space of loving awareness of mindfulness itself. So again, Jack, uh, from my heart, uh, much gratitude to you at a, both a personal level and also for your willingness to take this time here and, and offer and share your own wise heart uh, with so many beings. Happy to do it, Rick, and I have a, equally a great appreciation for the foundation and the work you're doing and the, the teachings and this wedding that we're all a part of of modern neuroscience that is saying all these 
traditional teachings really do change the brain and change the nervous system and we can live in a different way and so the, that that you're offering is really a great gift and um, I'm so uh, appreciative of it. Thank you, Rick. Oh, great. Thank you. Take care.